Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where I hasten to add that the intelligence goes to my guest, in this case, Trita Parsi. And uh, I've had him before on the show, and I just want to say he's one of the rare individuals that has the respect of the establishment. He he, uh, studied, uh, well, I want to say he's got a doctorate from uh, uh, American University, uh, Johns Hopkins, where he studied with Zbigniew Brzezinski and uh, F- what's how do you pronounce it? Uh, Francis Fukuyama, who told us that it was the end of history. Well, that hasn't turned out to be true. And it was Zbigniew Brzezinski that had any idea if we somehow defeated the Soviets in, in Afghanistan, that would be the end of that problem. We seem to have a more energy devoted to containing Russia now than we ever did under communism. And, and an author of a number of books that have been high, well received by our uh, foreign policy establishment. Uh, one is first was the Treacherous Alliance, a Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States. That was 207. Uh, then he had a, a, a very important book, uh, A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, Yale University Press 212. And uh, was selected by Foreign Affairs as the best book of 212. And his latest book was Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy, another Yale University Press book, 2017. Well, we didn't lose the enemy. Right now, Iran seems to be the everyone's convenient choice of an enemy. I should mention that you left Iran when you were only four years old. You, but your father uh, had run afoul of both the Shah's regime and the Ayatollah. You were in Sweden uh, having refuge. You also got several degrees there. So let me ask you, we're, we're in this incredible, uh, I'm, I, I've, I'm more frightened than I've been, and I'm an old guy, and I've written a lot about these things, of the possibility of using nuclear weapons now than I've ever been. At least in the old regime of the Cold War, there was an understanding, got tested by the Cuban Missile Crisis, that you really can't use these weapons. And now you have nuclear-armed Israel. We've managed to convince Iran not to go that route, but certainly Pakistan has nuclear weapons. There are lots of them around the world. We're saber-rattling with Russia. So why don't you tell us where we are now and how worried we should be? Well, we should be extremely worried about the risk of war in the region in the sense of an expansion of the war. We obviously already have a slaughter going on in Gaza by the Israelis. And I don't think we've ever been as close as we are now in terms of a direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. At this stage, the risk is not for that conflict to turn nuclear. However, if that conflict does take place, meaning not just an exchange of fire, but actually leads to uh, a a real war, then the risk of nuclearization in Iran is going to expand significantly in the sense that the Iranians do have a nuclear program, but it's civilian. It does not have currently a military dimension, but it will be very difficult to see that program remaining civilian if there is a major war. So as a result, um, uh, there's a tremendous amount of dangers that comes with Um, uh, a direct confrontation between Israel and Iran. And of course, from the U.S. standpoint, a very significant problem is that the U.S. most likely will get dragged into the war. Uh, Its ability to stay out of that war is very limited, and it would then be yet another disastrous war in the Middle East that does not serve U.S. interests uh, and is completely unnecessary and avoidable if we pursue a policy that is much more strategically uh, wise than the one that the Biden administration has pursued so far. So let me ask you a question. You wrote a recent column in which you suggested that uh, Netanyahu uh, seemed to be constraining things and so forth, and then blew it uh, in relation to Iran. I don't want to uh, mess up your article here, but... uh, I I couldn't understand because I don't have any insider information, but it seems that there was this, you know, Israeli attack violating one of the most sacred rules. You don't blow up embassies uh, and you certainly don't blow it up in a 
country that you think you've liberated, and then the other people seem to have power in Iraq and so forth. But uh, and then the Iran uh, fired back with what was presented as a massive attack, drones and so forth. And then Israel is supposed to, and, and with the help of the U.S., been able to thwart that. But reading your article, everybody seemed to be doing wink, wink here. Uh, that uh, uh, the U.S. knew all about and Israel knew all about the coming attack. Uh, it was not designed to be uh, enormously successful in punishing Israel. And as a result, when Israel retaliated, and you suggest it was a quite minor uh, retaliation, and then uh, Iran didn't even, they pretended to not even notice that. So is this some kind of bizarre game being played out before our eyes that ordinary mortals like myself and people listening can't possibly comprehend? No, I think in retrospect, it looks as if it was all very clean and uh, designed and choreographed to perfection, but it was not. What you have was a situation in which the Israelis kept on pressing the envelope, pushing the envelope, they had assassinated and killed several Iranians in Le Lebanon and Syria without an Iranian response. And they thought that they could go all the way to uh, even taking, you know, bombing an Iranian consulate. But it became one straw too many. Uh, and the Iranians decided to respond. They had lost face. Their territory had been attacked. Um, and there was a lot of pressure on Iran and a lot of communication between the United States and Iran to try to make sure that that conflict was somewhat contained and minimized. But what the Iranians ended up doing was nevertheless a rather large attack with you know, about 300 missiles uh, and, and, and drones and cruise missiles. Um, but they gave the US side a 72 hour heads up, uh, which enabled the US to come to Israel's aid and enable the Israelis to be on full alert, uh, as well as the Brits and the French. So. They shot down the vast majority of those projectiles, but nevertheless, seven missiles nevertheless managed to get through the Israeli air defenses and strike Israeli bases, three of them, which show that the Iranians actually do have the capacity, even with a 72-hour heads up, to penetrate Israel's air defenses. This essentially busted Israel's air of um, uh, in von, uh, air of uh, impunity and, uh, un, you know, the degree to which Israel essentially was viewed as being untouchable in the region. This is part of the reason why it was so difficult for the Israelis not to respond, because they did not want to see the Iranians managing to create a new set of rules in the region in which Israel didn't have the freedom of action of being able to whack Iran or whack Lebanon without getting any response, doing so complete impunity. But the US put a lot of pressure on the Israelis not to respond at all. And the response that came was clearly designed of making sure that the Iranians would be able to wave it off and not have to respond in kind, not have to escalate. So there's some credit that I think is deservingly going to the Biden administration for having helped diffuse this situation. But what my article points out, if you're referring to the one in the New York Times, is that even though the president managed this tactically quite well and avoided the worst outcome, what he did is that he managed the worst outcome of his own policy. Because the strategic uh, trajectory that the US, that Biden has put us on, is one in which we have been put on the precipice of war in the region. And it was only a question of time before episodes of this kind would happen. And even with this one being diffused does not mean that we will not have another one in another month or two months time. We should not be in this situation in the first place. If the United States from the outset had pursued a much different policy, pushing for a ceasefire rather than blocking it, we would have been able to diffuse tensions overall in the region and avoid a scenario in which there could have been a war between Iran and Israel in the manner that we just managed to, with some luck as well, evade. So in order to truly be able to minimize the risk of the U.S. getting dragged into the region again, we need a different policy that is not just tactically um, uh, clever in terms of avoiding the worst outcome, but is strategically effective in making sure that the worst outcomes don't even come into play to begin with. 
So let me ask you about this, because uh, there was an era uh, for the longest time, ever since the Six Day War, that Israel could just knock out any threat without much consequence. And that was also done with a lot of cooperation for the United States as far as targeting and so forth. And I, I do, and, and that sort of, however, um, has, first of all, given what you mentioned, the uh, slaughter in Gaza, everybody forgets that Israel's uh, presence or claim over the West Bank and uh, Gaza and part of Jerusalem came from a preemptive war. Now, I don't know if you agree with that, but I happened to be writing about it at the time and be, I was in the area and it was very clear. I was in Egypt and then in Israel. And it was very clear that Goliath was Israel uh, backed by the United States and David was Syria, Egypt and so forth, that they uh, did not have the kind of air force and weaponry and so forth. Uh, and anyway, the Palestinians had not attacked Israel. Actually, Palestinians uh, that were already in Israel before Six Day War, many of them offered their blood, their support, and so forth. Uh, and uh, so this whole image that has uh, been conducted that, uh, yes, Israel has a powerful military, but it needs it because it's David and it's surrounded by all of these countries, uh, is kind of a myth. Uh, that that has been stoked by the mass media and everything. And the other part of that myth is that Israel, even though it's David, is an invincible David and can win very quickly without suffering very much. Well, that's been disproved a number of times, but very prominently this time. They now seem to be in a never-ending war of their own, and so is the U.S. Is that a fair summary? I, I would agree that this idea that... Israel is David. Um, if it ever was true, it stopped being true a long time ago. Unfortunately, that is the perception that President Biden still seems to live in. Uh, and perhaps part of the explanation as to why he has adopted the line that he has. But Israel is not only uh, militarily superior, but at least up until uh, April 1st, believed that it had the freedom of action of whacking any country in the region with impunity without paying a price for it. That I think has now changed as a result of what happened between Iran and Israel. And that's part of the reason why it was quite a massive strategic mistake by the Israelis to take out the Iranian consulate because it validated what many had suspected that Iran had the capacity, but it was not known. Now it's confirmed that they have that capacity and most likely the Israelis are going to be very careful about doing something like that again, which means that we've returned to an era in which Israel no longer had, did not have that degree of freedom. So you cannot have that degree of freedom, even if it's been somewhat limited now, and claim that you are David. That is a, a freedom of action that only Goliath ever could have. Um, but it is very much a frame that seems to be informing Western policy. And as a result, supporting Israel, even as it is recklessly destabilizing the region, and then frankly putting uh, the US and Europe's own security at stake. I mean, when they Israelis attacked the Iranian consulate, they gave the Pentagon almost no heads up at all, essentially told them about it right before it happened. This infuriated the Pentagon and the Biden administration because it meant that we might end up in a regional war. It also meant that the uh, truce that currently exists between the United States and Iraqi and Syrian militias. As you know, they have killed three Americans in the last couple of months because of intensified attacks by them on the U.S. in the region as a way of pressuring the U.S. to pressure Israel for a ceasefire. But those attacks have now stopped for more than eight weeks. They could have restarted again as a result of what the Israelis did. So this is directly putting the U.S. into uh, the firing zone. Um, and what is stunning about all of that is that I, at, till this point, we see no consequences for Israel having done this. And this is, it goes back to Biden's approach to this issue in which he seems to be extremely deferential to Israel and accepting without consequence, a lot of actions by Israel that is directly undermining U.S. interests. 
Well, yeah, but Israel has every reason to think it can get away with anything it wants, because whatever criticism there may be of the slaughter, I personally think it's appropriate to talk about genocide if we actually look at the history of discussion of genocide. Others might not agree, but it certainly seems to be aimed at denying any agency to the Palestinians, uh, any possibility of their having any kind of governance or one person, one vote, or any other basic human rights, including the right, you know, the right to decide who who rules them or the area they live in. But but putting that aside for a second, why shouldn't Netanyahu think he can do whatever he wants? We just rewarded his arrogance with this huge uh, military assistance bill. You know, we just said whatever you do, and and I and there's a political reason you mentioned Obama's achievement. And I do think it was a, a major achievement in getting I- Iran to stop whatever it, w- it was doing that was frightening about its nuclear program. You celebrated that. At the same time, Netanyahu came and spoke to the U.S. Congress and denounced the sitting president, basically undermined his and, and he was received uh, in a almost universal applause. And, and he could do it again if you look at it. What is the choice for a voter? You've got a lot of young people now at these universities who have shown they don't buy the narrative. They want to uh, see some kind of accommodation of a Palestinian state as the UN uh, majority, I think 150 nations recognize. And yet uh, Netanyahu can have the confidence. He's actually much more popular in the U.S. Congress than he is in his own Knesset. You know, uh, it's one of these great ironies. And that so a voter, we all tell people you got to vote. We live in this democracy. Uh, you know, what, what do we do? Who's the lesser evil? Uh, it, it would probably seem to be a Biden. So what does that mean? He will underwrite a, a genocide, but do it more slowly or less dramatically uh, than, than than Trump. So where, where does, what is going on here? And and uh, what could you take it from there? Go ahead. I think you're right in the sense that if we don't impose any consequences when Netanyahu conducts himself in this way, we should not have the expectation that he will not continue to challenge U.S. interests in the manner that he has. And I, I would say that I think this is an extraordinary, strange situation that we're in because if I was sitting in the White House, I would be extremely worried about Biden's re-election chances, given how he has alienated so many critical elements of his winning coalition from 2020. Gen Z voters, African-American voters, and of course, in some key states, Arab-American voters. And all of this for some sort of an ideological um, um, adherence and commitment to Israel that also at the same time blinds the US to what Israel is doing uh, and is remarkably accepting of um, Israel's conduct, even though the president himself admits that Israel is committing war crimes because indiscriminate bombing as Biden uh, described Israel's campaign as is a war crime. There's gonna have to be some political changes in order for this to have, uh, for the situation to change. Uh, And I do suspect that that is coming because when you see the perspective of younger Americans about this issue, even on the right, it is changing dramatically. Uh, I don't think this is a generation that in any way, shape or form views Israel as uh, as David. I don't think even they viewed him as Goliath. I think it goes beyond that at this point. That change, however, will probably not manifest itself politically for another five to 10 years. But I think it is unavoidable at this point because what this episode has done is that it has given young Americans an informative experience about their perspectives of the Middle East, the US's role there and the role of Israel. I don't think it's gonna go away in any way, shape or form easily. So let me ask you, you are connected with, I didn't give you a proper uh, introduction, the Quincy Institute. And uh, the motto is help us achieve a world where peace is the norm and war the exception. You know, lots of luck on that. Uh, but and the Quincy Institute is a trans uh, action tank 
and Communications Project established to challenge the decades-long obsession of U.S. foreign policy decision makers with global military dominance and war. And I applaud that. I read a lot of the material that comes out of Quincy Institute. There are a lot of very respected, experienced veterans of American foreign policy and its wars. So, yes, it's an institute to be admired. And yet, despite your establishment credentials, and, and I'm not using that negatively. I mean, you are one of the, and not you, only you, but the other people at the Quincy Institute are very well informed, very experienced, you know, about all this. It seems naive uh, that we can get to, uh, you know, a world where peace is the norm and war the exception. I mean, you look right now, we're picking a fight with China uh, and, and, you know, we're denying their ability to use advanced chips and produce so they can get out of this middle income trap that they and India are in and try to get into advanced consumer products. We even deny them the right. They happen to be great at making solar panels and electric cars, and we want to threaten that in Cold War terms or enemy terms or the Orwellian find the enemy. And we do it all over the place. So just, you know, we're going to run out of time. I know you got other things to do, but tell me, how do you, how do you talk about peace in a culture, our culture, American culture now, that seems to be more pro-war uh, and more informed by, you know, and then we had, just let me throw this in in case people don't know, our two most important presidents who had war experience, <laughs> uh, George Washington and Dwight Eisenhower, George Washington, both in their farewell address after <laughs> running the government to being here. What did George Washington do? He says, I call upon my countrymen to avoid uh, false patriotism, the impostures of pretended patriotism, seek world influence with gentle, gentle means. That was George Washington. Eisenhower, of course, famously warned us about the military-industrial complex. It seems to me now this military-industrial complex is at the center of all American thinking. And this bill, by the way, increases their profit, their stock market evaluation. A lot of that money is not even going to Ukraine or Israel. It's going to the Defense Department contractors. I think there's plenty of reasons to be quite worried and... Um, perhaps even pessimistic about the situation. But I think what you are looking at, Bob, is where the elite is, where the foreign policy establishment is, and where the current policy is. And when one looks at that alone, the picture you present is very accurate. When you take a look at America as a whole and look at where the population is on these matters, I think there's plenty of reason to see some hope um, and some reason as to why things are going to be changing. Granted, of course, that they assert themselves and that we end up, we still have a political a system that, um, however imperfectly, nevertheless, seeks to represent the views of the population. As I mentioned earlier on, when you take a look at not only, let's just set aside Israel for a second. When you take a look at how younger Americans think about foreign policy, how they think about some of the cornerstones of American foreign policy of the last couple of decades that has led us into uh, these militaristic, adventurist, dominance-centered um, approaches, you see a situation in which, for instance, their views of American exceptionalism is starting to be dramatically different from the views of older Americans view of that. They do not think of the United States as a country that is so exceptional that it can allow itself to be above all other countries and all rules that it itself has put in place. When you take a look at how they view the spread of democracy and human rights, Less than 20% of younger Americans in polls that have been done over the course of the last five years are now in, of the view that using military force, even for the protection of human rights, meaning humanitarian interventionism, is justified. Those numbers are very different when you poll Americans 65 and up. 
So you're seeing a situation in which there's an entire one or two generations of Americans who have seen nothing but bad wars. This is not the generation, the great generation that had wars that were clearly against evil, uh, against the domination of the Nazis, etc. What they've seen is only bad wars. And they've also seen that those very bad wars are the reason as to why their standard of living is going to be lower than that of their parents, or at least a big reason as to why it's going to be lower than their parents. This has created a very different perspective on militarism, a very strong resistance against it. It is not reflected in the mainstream media. It is not reflected in the manner that the president talks now or the foreign establishment sees things. But it is manifested in the sense that if you want to run for president and win, you have to present yourself as an anti-war candidate. The last couple of presidents have done so. Hillary Clinton famously did not because she would have no credibility if she tried to. And it was a, a factor in her loss as well. You're seeing that increasingly in Congress as well. I think we're going to see much more of that going forward. Is it going to be sufficient to be able to overcome the stranglehold of the military industrial complex and the manner in which so much of America's economy has now become dependent upon the export of weapons and arms? It's going to be a significant challenge. But in this very complicated and overall problematic picture, I do see some very clear signs of hope. You know, I think uh, let me, we can wrap this up. I know you have to go to a meeting or something, but um, what it was, I don't know. No, no one ever seems to, every time I mention George Washington's farewell address after my recording or something, I'll go look it up to see if I invented this, you know, because why isn't it something that, <laughs> that's taught, you know, and sure enough, he talked, he was not an isolationist. He believed in trade. He believed, you know, but his, the whole thing, thinking of, a, of the founders, it seems to me, was how do we avoid being Rome? You know, they hated what, what, you know, what Rome became. They hated the French Empire, the Spanish, and the English. They broke with the, the mother country over this, this extension that you can't be a normal nation. You have to control as far as you can see. And, and uh, that, you know, power corrupts. And, absolute. and so I ask you one last question, because you have great establishment respect credentials and so forth. How do they justify this? I mean, I know, I, I, I knew it's big new Brzezinski who you studied under and okay, he has some passion left over from Poland and his father, the diplomat and so forth and be tough. But we, we we're in a situation now we want to contain communist China and we stress older oh, communists. On the other hand, our main weapon now against communist China is, is communist Vietnam, which we fought this war against. And what happened when we lost the war? Communist Vietnam and communist China went to war. Okay, same thing with Russia. Now, we got had arms control agreements and everything with the Russians when even when Stalin was there, uh, you know, right up through. You got a guy that we backed, Putin, uh, to be the anti-communist candidate. Yes, he'd come up through there. Uh, bureaucracy and their secret service and all that. But the fact is, he was Yeltsin's guy, and Yeltsin was a hopeless drunk. So we have Putin, and now he is the enemy of choice, and we can't do business with him and so forth. So I just really get to finally to the question, do we have sane adults watching the store? I mean, w w these are smart people. Why do they still talk? In, 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 it's fake news is what they do. It's constantly fake news. You spend 20 minutes. I tell my students, you go spend 20 minutes outside, and just Google these things. You'll see it's silly, silly talk. You know, we have on our campus, everybody's worried now, you know, uh, of the Jewish students are alarmed and so forth with all this warmongering. You know, I happen to be Jewish. I certainly know a lot of Jewish students. I see no reason where I teach at USC where we just stopped a, a valedictorian uh, who science oriented, brilliant woman because it might alarm the school. We have a thing, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, th th this scary talk, um, is very profitable, very profitable. And so, why do they, where are we going to get some rational people who say, look, you know, we have to be a normal nation, we have to 
right? Isn't that the message? You're, you're very smart about these things. Isn't that the message from BRIC, the BRICS alliance and the South speaking up? Isn't that the big issue that we are isolating ourselves? It certainly is. And I think the foreign policy establishment is not really taking that in. They think that the answer to this is just to educate the American public and the rest of the world as to why they're wrong and why the foreign establishment in Washington is right. Um, so, yeah, no, we, we, we do clearly have a, a highly problematic situation um, in this. And let me give you another quote. You talked about George Washington. Our institute is named after John Quincy Adams because of the speech that he gave in 1821. And I if you permit, I'm just going to read uh, a short you, segment you, of it. You're the one is, that has to go. You take as much time as you want. All right. Okay. America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She's the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She's the champion and vindicator only of her own. And then uh, the passage just slightly further down. If American engages in militarism, he says, essentially, the fundamental maxims of her policy would insensibly change from liberty to force. She might become the dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. This was a clear call, not for isolationism, but against militarism and adventurism in American foreign policy, not only because it's wrong, but because it would come at the expense of America's own freedom and liberties at home. And if you take a look at what is happening right now in the terms of Western countries' support at least the blind support for Israel and its war and slaughter in Gaza right now. You're seeing clear signs that in order to be able to sustain this level of blind support, we have to actually erode our own democracy at home. You're having students not being allowed to have freedom of speech on campus or freedom of assembly. You already have for quite some time efforts to uh, make sure that people give up their right to be able to choose if they so want to boycott uh, Israeli products they will no longer be able to get government contracts uh, as a company or as individuals in states like Texas, et cetera. You see in Germany in which slogans have been forbidden, you cannot say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. You see that demonstrations uh, against the war in Gaza in France and in Germany have been outlawed. You see how meetings and conferences have been forbidden. A former European minister, a Greek for, uh, minister of finance, is no longer allowed to speak in Germany uh, uh, on these matters. And has been told by the Germans that it, uh, German authorities that he will essentially uh, be prosecuted if he does. These are clear signs of how, in order to sustain this level of support, not just for our own militarism, but for the militarism of another country, we're going to have to erode our own democracy at home. And I think... This is, um, I don't think this is going to be accepted by the American public. I think this has gone too far now. I think we're going to see a major backlash against it. You know, uh, I know you have to go, but you've used the word slaughter a number of times. And, uh, and I think it's appropriate uh, here. But when you talk about the criminalization of dissent, right now in any classroom in America, uh, any high school or college classroom, if you refer to what Israel is doing as a slaughter, let alone do what the UN court is actually investigating now, whether it rises to genocide, you will, if not lose your job, certainly hurt your career and certainly feel very vulnerable. Uh, and, uh, and this is being accepted. And uh, I just read something in the old McCarthy days, it's very interesting, that and particularly relating to Hollywood and the Hollywood 10 and all the attacks, a disproportionately high number of people who were dragged before the, this inquisition were Jewish. You know, uh, there, this, this is really, I, I just want to end on that because uh, it's really truly disturbing to me that Jews are now Jewish people. My mother left Russia after the Bolshevik revolution, okay? Mm. You know, it wasn't to come here to embrace uh, uh, more violence and, and more terror. And I just want to end with the country you know most about, uh, even though you only were four years old when you left, but you uh, obviously are an expert on, on Iran. And it gets back to Orwell's old finding the enemy, 
finding the enemy. And after all, we have some responsibility for what happened in Iraq because we overthrew Mohammed Mossadegh, the last real election they had in 19, what was it, 54, 53? So, <laughs> yeah. So I just want to ask you, I know, again, quickly, we've been raised really to think of Iran as a center of evil. It's convenient to this whole thing, because just as we, you know, and then Egypt somehow, where they have no more political freedom, they jailed most of the people who were active in the Arab Spring, the conditions are awful, and they are actually the people who had a war with with Israel once, but they got accepted, Uh, Jordan was accepted, that's the other country that was involved, Six-Day War, Uh, and yet um, the Palestinians are made to have the whole responsibility for anti-Semitism in the world, for the insecurity of Jews anywhere. It is the, if we talk about fake news, it's it's the big lie writ large, Roger. Is it not? And just maybe, you know, how to think about Iran? Is it, you know, what, just a center of evil? No, I, I, you know, that's obviously quite cartoonish. um, And it says, quite a lot about the foreign policy establishment in Washington that tends to reduce complex geopolitical issues to good versus evil and Marvel comics type of the storylines. Iran's regime is a highly repressive government, uh, highly interventionist in the region. Uh, It's playing the game of a great power in the region on a regional scale. Uh, It's definitely challenging the U.S. and other potential uh, or, or external powers that are trying to have a footprint in the region is um, a country that has weakened the states of other states in the region by supporting militias, etc. However, take a look at the track record of almost any other major country in the region. I'm not talking about the smaller countries that don't, don't even have the power to do this. And you will see that all of them are doing things that are highly problematic, maybe different, maybe justified differently. But this is not a story in which you have a a region of innocence and then one country with blood on its hands. We did a study at the Quincy Institute about four years ago, and we looked at all of the interventions of regional states in the region between 2010 and 2020. And Iran, without a doubt, is one of the most interventionist powers in the region. However, from 2015 and onwards, the Turks and the Emiratis actually had surpassed Iran in terms of interventions in the region. Five out of the six most interventionist countries in the region, uh, Israel, Turkey, Saudi, UAE, and Qatar, are all funded by and armed by the United States. There's allies of the U.S. Oftentimes, they're intervening in the region against each other. So the idea that Iran in some how some way is standing out in the region, or certainly you know is a, an outlier because it's just doing it much more than anyone else, is not borne by the facts. It doesn't mean that Iran or the Iranian regime is, is positive. I, I personally don't think it is. But looking for good guys in geopolitics um, is not an exercise that I think is particularly fruitful. Uh, and then you should be reminding people that Iran did not do 9-11, did not attack the World Trade Center. Fifteen people came from Saudi Arabia and four others from other countries, including Egypt. I'll end on that. I want to thank you um, and, uh, you know, for taking the time. Uh, how do we get more material? Trita, Parsi, uh, they just go to the Quincy Institute? Go to the Quincy Institute, Quincy, I-N-S-T dot O-R-G, or go to uh, my personal website, treataparsi.com. I do a lot of stuff on Twitter at T Parsi, uh, and they can get in touch with me or my institute uh, through those channels. Okay. And I want to thank, I thank you, and I want to thank Christopher Ho and Laura Kondarajian uh, at KCRW, the excellent uh, NPR station in Santa Monica for uh, hosting these uh, podcasts. Uh, Joshua Shear, our executive editor, who insisted that I get you because he was so impressed the last time we had you. Uh, Diego Ramos, who writes the introduction. Uh, Max Jones, who does the video. And the JKW Foundation, in memory of a very independent thinker, uh, Gene Stein, 
who cared a great deal about what was the suffering of the Palestinians, which has only increased since her passing for supplying some funding for the show. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence.